space. Curiosity. They go hand in hand, like sprocket and chain, or peanut butter and jelly. Two halves of a perfect system. And I should know this. I build rockets and robots in my free time. And as cheesy as it sounds, I never knew I wanted to be an engineer. I wanted to be a lawyer for most of my life. I love talking to people, and I love arguing, so I thought I should be a lawyer. But nonetheless, I decided to join a robotics team my freshman year of high school. I went to the first meeting, absolutely hated it. Went to the second meeting, also hated it, and decided to go to a final third meeting. At that third meeting, the head mentor at the time gave myself and two other freshman girls a huge mechanism on our robot. If that mechanism were to work, we would win the competition. If it didn't work, we would totally lose the competition. Let's just say it didn't really work. <laughs> But nonetheless, from that moment on, I fell in love with engineering and robotics. I stuck with the program all four years and still currently serve as a mentor to this day. And I didn't realize until my senior year of high school, when I started to write Common App essays about robotics, why I loved it so much. I realized I loved robotics because it empowered me. It made me curious. It was my own way of discovering something I thought was unknown, and for me, that was engineering. I also learned that that curiosity lives in everyone. People can discover it through art or history, any way they find possible. But for me, it was robotics. And that same curiosity empowers us to become an interplanetary species. But before me, there were many others that thought this way. First, we have Goddard, the father of modern rocketry. Goddard was shooting off rockets in his backyard and in deserts from the 1920s until the 1940s. Essentially, he was trying to prove that you could semi-control a rocket, basically a bomb, well enough to shoot up into the air and not always have it explode. Not all of his missions were successful. <laughs> Next up, we have the space race, or rather, the Cold War. The U.S. wanted to prove that we could safely land a human on the moon, and we did. With Apollo 11, we landed a man on the moon and proved that we can get out of Earth's atmosphere, and we explored the stars for the first time. But beyond history, we have media progressing us forward into wanting to become interplanetary. For one, we have the Jetsons. A popular TV show decades ago that depicted people traveling from one planet to another and living in space. More recently, we have *The Martian*, a book by Andy Weir that got transformed into a movie last year. It showed astronauts traveling to Mars as if it was normal. And Matt Damon might get stuck on the planet. I don't want to spoil it for you. But we have media and history progressing us forward into wanting to become interplanetary. So, what does it really take to be interplanetary? To start, it takes about seven months for humans to safely travel to Mars. Mars is really far away. It's not a text over. It's it's a long journey traveling at a very high velocity. And with that, we'll need reusable rockets rather than expendable vehicles. Reusable rockets can land and launch within seconds. Expendable vehicles can't. They just crash, and we'll need to build a new one. We also will already need fuel on Mars. For example, if there was one gas station in Pomona. And we wanted to drive all the way to Vegas. We could get there on one tank, but there's no way we're getting back if there's no gas station in Las Vegas. So we'll need fuel already on Mars, whether that be getting the fuel there from Earth or creating the fuel on Mars, which we've deemed is possible. Next up, the rocket science behind getting a person to space hasn't been worked out. We're still figuring out the math. It's never been done before, and we're still figuring it out. But one of the scariest parts about becoming interplanetary in relation to Mars is something we call the seven minutes of terror. The seven minutes of terror is a transmission delay between Earth and Mars, and vice versa. This means that you can have a rocket safely land on the surface of Mars and not know about it until seven minutes later. This also means we could have a huge catastrophe on the surface of Mars and also not know about it for seven minutes. And if we were to think of a solution, We couldn't get it back in time to the astronauts or people on Mars for another seven minutes, leaving people in the dark for 14 minutes. It's not a text over to Earth. It's a letter sent by carrier pigeon, or at least it really feels that way. But nonetheless, we've decided we want to get to space. We want to become interplanetary. Okay, cool. So, what are these companies working on now? Let's talk about two: NASA and SpaceX. NASA is currently working on SLS. 
or the Space Launch System. SLS utilizes older technologies and bringing it into the new era to get us to Mars. They're working on SLS, which utilizes RS-25, or the Space Shuttle main engine. RS-25 is the same engine you can see on Endeavour at the California Science Center. They're also utilizing the Orion capsule. The Orion capsule is the same capsule that took man to the moon, and we're learning from it in order to bring it into a new light and take us to Mars. NASA is also working on Curiosity, their 2012 Mars rover. And in five years, we've learned more from that rover than we would have ever known otherwise. For example, it took about five mechanical devices to land that rover on Mars, proving that we can land something on Mars. Mars is a very thin atmosphere, so it's hard to slow down. It's not like Earth. So with this, we learned that we can land something. Curiosity has also found traces of water and possible traces of microorganisms, proving that this could be a habitable place for us to live. Next up, we have SpaceX. SpaceX is the first ever privately funded space exploration company. Currently, they're working on Falcon 9. Falcon 9 is their rocket that they've launched, landed, and then relaunched, proving that reusable rocketry is a viable option for space travel. They're also working on Falcon Heavy. Falcon Heavy is basically three Falcon 9s strapped together, so we could get enough thrust and enough room to get a bunch of people all the way to Mars. And lastly, they're working on the Dragon capsule. Their Dragon capsule is similar to Orion, where it's meant to get people to places that are kind of close by. It's taken astronauts to the International Space Station already. But beyond NASA and SpaceX, we have other companies working hard in order to get people to become interplanetary. For example, we have Blue Origin. Blue Origin's founder is Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos is the same founder that's been on Amazon for years. We also have Virgin Galactic. Virgin Galactic CEO is the same man who runs Virgin Airlines, and he's trying to commercialize space travel. We also have companies like ULA, the United Launch Alliance, Aerojet Rocketdyne, SpaceX, NASA. All these companies are trying to get their foot in the game to become interplanetary. All these companies are spending billions and billions of dollars to get rockets all the way to space, and not just our, at not just our galaxy, but beyond our galaxy, into places farther than the Milky Way, which seems insane, it's crazy, but we're working hard to get there. But the real question here is, why? Why are we doing this? We just proved that rockets are expensive, they're unreliable, and the math isn't worked out. So why do this? Quote Kennedy during the space race, he said, we will go to the moon and the other thing. The other thing was referring to Mars. We wanted to get to Mars before the turn of the last century. And in 2017, we're finally close. And there's two ways at looking at becoming interplanetary, the practical sense and the passionate sense. Let's start off with the practical sense. For one, we have climate change, or rather, human-produced climate change. You can see through satellites that are powered through space exploration that Earth's atmosphere is shrinking at an alarming rate. We might need a backup plan. We don't know how long we can sustain on this planet. Next up, we have Earth's tendency to kill off every living thing on the planet every couple of millions of years. We don't want to end up like the dinosaurs. So again, we need a backup plan, and becoming interplanetary provides us with one. And lastly, Another reason we want to become interplanetary is it will teach us more about the human race than we would have ever known otherwise. For example, we know what it takes to be a living being on Earth. We know we need air, we need water, we need all these things. But what does it take to become a living being on another planet, another galaxy? We've evolved in the past. Can we evolve even further? Do we need oxygen and air if we try to live on another planet? We don't know unless we become interplanetary. Next up, we have the passionate sense, the reasons I want to get to space. <sighs> Curiosity lives in all of us. Every single person in this room is curious about something. And at the heart of humanity is the want to explore. The same reasons we visited other continents or built planes or anything. We're all curious. We all want to know what we think is unknown. And becoming interplanetary is one of the biggest feats in, Amer in, a, yeah, in the history of humanity that we haven't explored yet, and we've been curious about it since the start. Anyone can go outside, stare up at the stars, and wonder what's out there. It seems far, but every year we feel closer and closer. We see people getting there, rovers going there. It's closer and closer every day, 
and we're curious, and we want to get there. Now, you might be sitting here wondering, what can I do? I'm not a rocket scientist, I'm not an engineer. What can I do? Well, there's a couple things. The first is be aware of what it takes to actually get to space. Like we saw, it takes a lot. Know what companies are doing in order to get to space. There's amazing companies out there working and spending a lot of money in order to get us there. Secondly, lobby our government in order to fund space exploration. Space exploration makes up less than half a percent of, Earth, of the US government's annual spending budget. And that's not enough if we want to become truly interplanetary. And lastly, be curious. Curiosity is what's propelled us into so many explorations in our lifetimes. It's gotten us to those uncharted territories. And if you, I, and everyone in this room is curious enough to want to become interplanetary, we can transform a planet into a habitable one, like Mars and like this. Thank you.